Hello and welcome back to Spirit Critique, where in the spirit of constructive criticism, we discuss folk magic, brujeria, and spiritual media of all kinds in order to unpack, understand, and deepen our own spiritualities. Today's subject is American Brujeria by J. Allen Cross. If you have been following my experience of reading this book, you have an understanding of how this is going to go. If you would like a more in-depth, full tangents, rambling, rant segment, please subscribe to my Patreon and check out the full unedited version there. Let's get into it. It is going to be a long one. Make sure you have a nice little drink, a cup of tea, and a snack. I'm not going to spend much time talking about J. Allen Cross, the author. Every single other review of this book takes the time to read verbatim his description in the back of the book, and I just plain refuse. The only way out is through, so let's march, troops. I would like to remind the class that this is a critique and not a review. If you don't know what that difference is, the education system has failed you, and I don't know how to fix that. The first impression this book left me with raises some concerns. There are nine endorsements for this book, which is an odd amount of validation in my opinion, especially for a spiritual book, a how-to spiritual book at that. Especially when we take into context that seven of those forwards are written from people who write for the same publishing house. The picture of an underlying industrial influence comes into focus. I find that so ominous. It is such a subtle red flag that I think most would simply skip past, especially because these are forwards, they're not even part of the book, rather than recognizing the multiple boilerplate endorsements for the marketing tool that they are. After reading American Brujeria three times, I've come to this conclusion. The magic described cannot be an accurate reflection of a spiritual practice. I refuse to believe that this is the way J. Allen Cross practices in totality, at least. There's no way that this book is somehow the milk, the cow, and the family farm. He's not giving that shit away. And I really want to trust and believe that he has a much richer spirituality than this. Like, he has to, right? I don't know, man. I smell marketability. I don't smell much authenticity. But let's dive into this sea of rigid definitions of magic. Unchecked Catholic brainwashing and sinister marketing off the pain of colonization and forced conversion. Quickly, let me bring to your attention that you can turn off this video at any time should you feel uncomfortable. I encourage you to comment any and all grievances you have with my critiques in the comment section. If you're gonna be loud, you're gonna drive up my engagement. That is the spiritually binding contract you signed by continuing to watch. No blood required. American Brujeria proclaims itself as a guide to practicing Brujeria as an American-born person. It's supposed to target the market that is American-born Latinos who are in a vulnerable place between reconciling the problematic qualities of Catholicism and embracing neo-paganism. I should be in that box, which I think qualifies me even more so to give this critique. Even so, the book outright misses the mark. The information is wrapped in a personal opinion and a strict Catholic framework. I find the contents to perpetrate the issues of the church far more than being a way to reclaim the mysticism of the religion outside of church authority. Spanglish. I'm not sentimental, and I don't like when opening narratives fail to effectively frame the rest of the book. This chapter heavily attests that the whole book is written as a love letter to marginalized people. It also professes a series of notions about holding marginalized identities that are kind of all over the spectrum, and while I agree with the one notion that having or holding multiple or any marginalized identities makes you more comfortable and familiar navigating liminality and thus more magically inclined. In this case, I just get the vibe that it's setting up a defense, which I find ominous <laughs> in any kind of educational content. 
I take issues with the base definition of brujería in this book, like literally every single part, and I'd like to share my feelings with you in seven points. Cross defines brujería as, I quote, American brujería is a term that I came up with to describe the folk magic that has been brought to the United States by Mexican immigrants. Let's dive into that sentence and chop it up and eat it bit by bit. Folk magic is ubiquitous. Everybody does it, American or not. Literally everywhere. What we call folk magic is often a rebranding of indigenous practices made to fit into a dominating religion. The type of magic you do is more personal than cultural often. It makes the idea of a strictly American version of brujería kind of silly. Furthermore, implies that Americans are a monolith, which is highly inaccurate for any group you decide to describe as such. The terms American and Mexican are nationalities based on the existence of colonial powers. The idea that these are separate cultures perpetrates the goals of those colonial structures. Implying that a man-made border defines cultural values is an intentionally created idea and something that we, as the diasporic result of said colonialism, shouldn't uphold. With this in mind, we can disregard the notion that this magic is entirely brought from modern-day Mexico. Magic is entirely brought across the border from modern-day Mexico. I live in Colorado, in the southwestern United States. My family has lived in this region since before Mexico was here. The border crossed us many times, which contributes to a feeling of liminality. This is especially present, this notion of liminality, in the Chicano identity as well as the Chicano movement. Ni de aquí ni de allá is a sentiment that resonates with me and many other people who live in this liminal space to this day. I therefore refute the idea that all of my magic is funneled out of Mexico by migrants. Those two thoughts are so disconnected that it is irresponsible to put them in the same sentence together. I raise my eyebrows when reading the way the author sets up a safe space for in-between people, only to shatter that safety almost immediately, further marginalizing people by separating Mexican and American. Granted, these are identities that people uphold, and because of that, we have to respect them. I crave more nuanced discussions. I just want to hold both of these ideas at the same time in one hand, have your identity is valid, girl boss, and in the other say, this identity is some colonial bullshit. Are you sure you want to attach it to yourself? We continue with Cross's definition of brujería. <clears throat> Quote, this work includes the lighting of novena candles, calling upon saints, and the veneration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, spiritual cleansing through limpias and the casting of spells known as hechizos. Brujería is an umbrella term. End of story. It is not inherently Catholic. It does not require saints or novena candles. Many practices intentionally do not include Catholicism. It is additionally a bad idea to force Christian influence into our definition of brujería. We had to hide our magic within this identity, within this idea of folk magic, because of the forced conversions of the Catholic Church. The pain of secrecy is something we draw power from even still. The path towards an accurate definition of our magic has to include decentralizing Catholicism. I am deeply saddened by the lack of depth to Cross's words. We are quickly approaching becoming elder voices in this community. I want us to take more responsibility for each other. I want this loose band of practitioners to look upon each other and ask questions like, 
what is this doing for the next generation? You can't uphold pro-Catholic narratives in marginalized spaces. It's violent inherently. We have to talk about it for sure. We have to discuss it. We have to unpack it and hell, even reclaim some of that shit. The mysticism within Catholicism is rich and has many depths and I think is a beautiful framework for many people, POC especially, to use and draw upon. Never to perpetrate the very same colonialism that brought us to this space, but to simply reclaim the parts of it that are absent of brainwashing, church control, and propaganda. Point seven. Limpias are not a required practice. Limpias can be common, but they're not necessarily required to look like the stereotype of brujeria with eggs and feathers and copal and other borrowed curanerismo concepts. I frankly don't even have the patience to talk about hechizos here. They are optional. You might not even call your spell work that in your practice. Let's move on. Let's move on. I don't know, dudes. I'm just bored already. This definition of brujeria is so rigid and unrelatable that I find myself just tuning out already. The moment I read through these words, I checked out. The rest of this section is mostly nonsense grasping at straws, so let's get through it quickly. We lightly touch on cross-cultural influences, uphold more colonial identities, jerk off the Aztec empire, and move on. We attempt to define traditional brujeria, but fail to do so outside of, it's a secret, I don't know. I don't know. So I guess, no learning, no harm, no foul. Moving on. We get to the appropriation section, and honestly, I'd summarize the author's words with, uh, anybody can do this, but be nice and don't get called out on the internet, okay? There's a secret truth behind that statement. <laughs> I'd love to see a dose of self-awareness. Subtextually, Cross affirms that the magic being described cannot truly be appropriated. It's open to anybody because it is a combination of two already existing open practices, Catholicism and New Age spirituality. So like, yeah, anybody can cook. We move on to the very aptly titled Basics, and my soul completely checks out. I don't have it in me to summarize this non-chapter for you. It is all in the title. I don't know what you want from me. I'm tired. Can I just have a tangent for a second? The use of Spanish in this book frustrates me. It doesn't read as an honest use of two languages by a bilingual person. It feels like the writer for Disney's Coco came and put their fucking Mexican TM spice on it. The use of Spanish, nouns particularly, reminds me of the way that I used to speak to white classmates in third grade to prove I was actually Mexican. This whole use, the entirety of the use of Spanish in this book, reads as if it's only being done for POC points which is fucking hilariously dark because the use of Spanish in this way validates your separation from whiteness as a performance to whiteness. In a concerning way, it reads as self-deprecating before someone else can, and that coping skill makes my heart sad. It's unfortunately relatable and something that we need to be aware of so we can stop perpetrating it. The next chapter is actually my favorite. It is all about working in a church and how to do so covertly. The chapter has the most value to me, in part because this section feels like it comes from Cross's actual experience, not some secondhand narrative he picked up through the grapevine of the internet. That's the commentary. Next! So 
So, I know you all are waiting for me to tear into the Guadalupe chapter, and I will. First, I want to talk about the culture around this book, specifically the reviews I've watched, all of which I find lacking. Across the board, they're dick writing this book like it's a cultural liaison for all diasporic Mexicans. Especially popular reviews, interestingly, come from people who aren't in a practice that can be called brujeria. The few reviewers I found who actually call their practice brujeria tend to have more neutral opinions rather than rave reviews. All the same, few strive to levy the many warranted criticisms against this book. Because this book upholds that it's describing a type of magic performed by American-born, culturally Mexican folk Catholics, those are the voices we should turn to first. And I saw no well-versed practitioners of Mexican-American folk Catholicism, which is a much better title for this book. Consider that moving forward. The only review I saw from a traditional bruje was from the Wicked Witch of LA, which, <laughs> shout out to you, bitch. Thanks for having my favorite review of this book. I love you, bitch. Have a good day. As we move forward, I need to reaffirm this disclaimer. We are not here to condemn, harass, or slander the author of American Brujeria in any capacity. And I fully expect all of the people watching this to maintain a standard of compassion throughout this video and throughout this series. <clears throat> As you all well know, I work through Our Lady of Guadalupe and I have spent many years developing my relationship with her inside of a Catholic framework and outside of it. For me, because of my ancestry, that involves looking into her connections with indigenous deities. I have several thoughts that all need to coexist in your mind for this argument to make sense, okay? We, me, cross, as the colonized, liminal people this book is allegedly directed towards, come from all over this vast continent, multiple continents descending from many different tribes and nations, most of which either grew to maintain their own sovereignty or, even more likely, were colonized by the Aztec Empire, ruled by the Mexica people, later colonized by Spain, and then even later colonized by the state of Mexico. Each instance of colonization separates us from the culture that runs through our veins. Those of us living outside of modern-day Mexico are even more separated. To overcome this separation, and in our missions to decolonize ourselves, many of us end up falling back onto things like the Aztec Empire and the gods of their state religion. Conveniently, some of the most well-documented Mesoamerican religious practices. With the tip of this iceberg visible, we have to do some big boy processing. A state religion, historically, is a tool for control and centralizing power. It rarely accurately describes the actual beliefs of individuals. The state religion, including all of the problematics of a state-mandated religion, is often the closest we get to finding our ancestral practices. That's okay. Not great, problematic, and overgeneralized, but it's still an understandable step towards the decolonization we strive for. Likewise, many of us tend to cling to the indigenous roots of Guadalupe by clinging to goddesses like Cotalique or Tonatzin, all the while misunderstanding the entity, misappropriating the qualities of multiple divinities into an amalgamation of the three, many of us then wrap that amalgamation into a Guadalupe disguise and call it synchronization. I think that this is, unfortunately, a necessary step in the Catholicism to Indigenous religion pipeline, problematic as it is. 
stepping outside of this historical lens into a more spiritual, metaphysical one. Indigenous people from across the Americas share many archetypical gods. The plumed serpent, the corn goddess, the moon goddess, etc. My belief is that spirit being all-knowing presents to us in the most accessible ways possible. The goal is always worth the means. Often, I find Guadalupe leads us to our mothers, our lost maternal culture. She may present as a corn goddess, but don't jump to call her Tonatzin. I've known her to identify herself and the spirits she is intertwined with for you specifically. She will let you know what to call her. She will teach you who she is leading you towards. There's no need to jump on the bandwagon and affirm with 100% certainty that Guadalupe equals Tonatzin. If you, as a Mexica descended person, decide to uphold this idea, more power to you, go off. Can't tell you shit. However, comma, just know that there are a multitude of names, faces, pantheons that have a corn goddess that can be synchronized with Guadalupe. The chapter then diverts and start grasping at straws to try and identify this spirit we're calling Guadalupe. Calling upon Revelations 12 and fucking numerology to try and fill out the missing pieces. It's like trying to fill the drywall with toothpaste. The altar setup is pretty sound, described as a table with stuff on it. I guess that's not wrong. There's a lot more you can put into your altar for Guadalupe, depending on your practice. I choose to believe this piss-poor definition of an altar is the result of crosses understanding the hyper-individuality of a personal altar, rather than an intentional choice to mislead you or being from a source of ignorance. On a spiritual note, I recommend looking up a consecration prayer to Mary, tweaking that, and using it over the space, the tools, and all of Guadalupe's altering, altar, essentially consecrating each part of it to her. <sighs> the rosary section starts off with some divine feminine bullshit, and I just need everybody to hear that term from a non-Hindu person and run their asses in the other direction. That term only tangentially applies to Guadalupe, because vagina. There is a real entity that is the mother of all. And it's easy to identify that entity as the divine feminine. Again, the only real issue is that doing so appropriates an originally Hindu concept and applies it to spirits who have their own ways of being the divine mother and discussing the gender spectrum. Just be careful with your language. That's all I'm saying. A personal point, the rosary is not difficult to pray. I need you to stop telling yourself that lie. It is tedious, time-consuming, and repetitive by design. Learn the prayers, use an app, join a group, write your own. There are tools. Please stop lying to yourself. Please stop crossing yourself by saying that this religious practice is difficult or hard. You are creating a false narrative and a feedback loop of pain, which will further separate you from a desire to want to pray the rosary. The Guadalupe mysteries are interesting to me. Not unique, not clever, but interesting. Theoretically, you can do this with any Marian apparition you're calling out to, you know, replacing the traditional mysteries of the rosary with major events of their apparition story. I think that's interesting. The rest of this chapter reads like old Tumblr posts condensed into a cohesive statement minus the gifts, the jokes, and the meme references. It's there. I, I don't know. These are the same candle associations you have seen on every brujeria, hoodoo, and folk magic blog or social media page ever. It's the same, no depth, no explanation, no meat, all broth. Not a stock, broth. An example. 
the chuparosa candle, yeah? A candle image steeped in mythology boiled down into a love spell. There's a tale I can't and won't fully recant for you here that explains why we use Miracle for the Day of the Dead and likewise explains why the Chuperosa candle brings love as it's attested to. Tale of two lovers torn apart by war, a man dies in battle and the woman dies either by suicide or heartbreak depending on how deep you are in patriarchy at that point. The sun god feeling bad for the kids makes old girl into a miracle so she shines like the sun and the dude into a hummingbird so they can be together throughout time. It's a sex analogy. They be fucking. There's a belief that hummingbirds harvest nectar without disturbing the flower and that therefore the spirit brings gentle love. I don't know about that. That seems factually weak to me. Additionally, hummingbirds take nectar from multiple flowers. If you're in a poly relationship, cool. But I don't know that this energy works for monogamy. I don't know, the analogy here just feels weak to me. Yet blindly, we use the damn candle for love, calling upon this fuckboy of a bird spirit to help. No shade to the hummingbird as a species or spiritual entity. Special shout outs to Marigold. Woo! The rest can be an interesting reference if you don't have any other books on candle reading or can't use common sense in divination. We are almost released from this Dante-esque journey. Next chapter. Generic opening followed by some solid tips. My favorites are, number one, baptize your saint statues. I think that's very good. It's a very good way to cleanse as well as invite the spirit in. It reflects the practices that Catholic saints, assuming they were living people, had to go through. Um, it also consecrates the statue. It is something you should repeat on the feast day of the saint every year. Number two, well, that's actually it. That's, that's, that's all I got. Sorry. We careen out of control to talk about cool glasses of water being conduits, which is a borrowed idea from Espiritismo and not intrinsic to folk Catholicism. Blessed wine is more appropriate if we're talking straight Catholic mysticism. Then we bounce into Orishas, which is a red flag. I feel very... Keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth! When it comes to any generalized reference to another spiritual tradition. Then Cross makes mention that the Orishas don't have time to answer daily prayers, which is at odds with what I and my limited knowledge know to be true. Not my business. Cross then touches on appropriate offerings for saints and then layers on more appropriated espiritismo traditions and rules about altars. Here's my thing about that. I have no issue with borrowing ideas. And frankly, the practices of espiritismo, folk Catholicism, and brujería blend together very well. I'd even call them supplemental to one another. This is just an unsighted source and contributes to an I learned this on the internet and regurgitated it into a Word document and then printed it and sold it. Kind of energy. To the author's credit, this is a good introduction to maintaining altered energies. This is, the issue is just the blind mixing and mashing of traditions without explanation, without creditation. The missing explanation, that yes and, of spirituality is where the real juicy stuff is. When you start asking why, that's when you truly develop. That's my belief, at least. In general, my prayer for greater discernment within the spiritual community at large will be answered by returning to a first grade writing class and asking ourselves the five W's. And I mean continually asking too until we get to the root of the answer. No more of this superficial pedal bullshit. I want to get to that tap root of knowledge. I want that for you too, for yourself, for your health. For your pride. The next session is a mini compendium made of Cross's opinions on folk saints, their associations and potential uses. 
Basically, if you Google Mexican folk saints, it's the first four options you see in a few paragraphs from their Wikipedia page. There's a section on Catholic saints which uses a lot of synchronized saints, those that are synchronized within ATRs, which is eyebrow raising, namely Saint Lucy, Martha, and Bada Bada. There's a few spell recipes to blindly follow and for almost all the saints, and that's it. Uh, that's the whole chapter. Moving along. JL and Cross has been roasted for the next chapter like crazy. And frankly, I like to keep a little more low-key with my Santa Muerte, so I'm not going to share too much of my own opinion. Cross claims, with bass in his voice, that Santa Muerte is a holdover from a Spanish spirit, La Parca, then indirectly calls her a narco saint before expressing how dangerous she is. Going so far as to call these opinions not unfounded. I like that Cross rightfully calls Santa Muerte's following complicated. They are complicated. What can I say? I'm a lover of nuanced statements. We're gonna do this like this. Rather than doing some long-winded, wordy explanation about why these are misleading, inaccurate, or blasphemous statements, I'm just gonna list out all the shit that he says in this chapter in a rapid-fire comment style. Ready? Death is devoid of a moral compass. Cross claims that her patronages are morally devoid, i.e. criminals, sex workers, drug dealers, queer people, handicapped, the poor, and nonconformists. Santa Muerte is a desperate spirit, meaning you should only ask her for favors if no one else will grant them. Death is ugly. Death destroys everything you love. Venerating Santa Muerte is like inviting death to roam amongst your family. Does this shit sound Catholic or what? That brainwashing runs deep. She's highly transactional. Cut her her check. Not wrong. You will be harshly punished for not paying her. She destroys your life for shits and gigs. She kills your livestock and pets also for shits and gigs. She's an unnecessary spirit for Americans. This isn't a rude comment, but Cross recommended working with angels because they're nice and have more empathy for the human experience. Cross pits Guadalupe against Santa Muerte, diminishing one female deity to raise up another. Interesting. St. Jude is apparently a dark spirit now? This must be that new geography. Why is this even in this chapter? Put him with the folk saints. Fuck. Santa Muerte is a lifelong commitment. Uwu, she'll kill you if you leave her. White Santa Muerte is love and light and softness and going to heaven. But black Santa Muerte is dark and violent and dangerous. Then he fucking tells you how to do it. Like after all this setup, Dude's like, okay, now go try it anyway. Summon death with all this fear in your heart. Go ahead. Sad I? I don't know. That's the chapter, folks. That's it. That's all he has to say. Yay, on to Olympias. Look, the rest of this book is a series of rushed lists of materials and recipes without any explanation, no depth, no theology, just the recipe. Just blindly follow this recipe like I told you to. So I'm going to go through this quickly. I recommend you do the same. This chapter starts with a simple, curanderos and brujos are different, okay? Cross reminds the reader that you can't use any of these titles because that's something that's earned by serving the community before giving a heartfelt, anyway, let's try their shit. The next section goes like this. Common plant name and what it's good for, and that's it. Usual, vapid, points, recipe, 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 all unexplained. Christian God is the one true God, never forget. 
more curanderismo to take home with you. And then Cross explains the concepts of baridas and limpias, most of which is lifted from Erika Buenaflor and Cheo Torres almost wholesale. Then, after telling you not to play curandero, giving away others' recipes, Cross then tells you in a single chapter how to take on clients. This hollow section finally ends with a cautionary tale that should have been at the start of this fucking chapter. And I... It feels like a janitor putting up a wet floor sign after you've slipped on pee-pee at the Costco. And don't you know I slipped on pee-pee and broke two vertebrae which had to be fused together? The spell section starts off strong with an empowering all power comes from God, TM, and you can't do anything without God, TM. Then there's this lovely little casting brujeria spells for beginners in the style of a Tumblr post. Then we do a quick saunter into Solomonic hours and days of power before shimmying over into Dianic style moon worship. Another listicle of herbs, and then we're done. This section is incredibly simple. It is how to make herb-infused oil. I like the sunflower oil tip. It's the whole chapter, plus a few more unexplained recipes, also unsighted. This section starts off with a comical anecdote about Cross's grandma to frame the magical experience of using Vix. Then we talk about Vix magic like it's just been discovered. And Cross talked a lot about this chapter in interviews, and it seems to be something he's really proud of. More power to you, I guess. On a safety note, I'm not sure how wise it is to burn Vix. There's a recommendation to dress a candle with Vix and I get the logic. Vix contains camphor. Camphor is often used to dress candles, spiritual baths, and a multitude of practices, especially prominent within ATRs, especially those that came out of the Caribbean. Vix has camphor, which equals camphor replacement, which equals use as you would use camphor. Put it on a candle, burn it. I just... I don't know about the other ingredients in Vix and what that does to your lungs after you burn it on a candle. It's your health, not mine. I don't care. There's some cute shit about red ribbon and scissors and I swear to God, I remember this Tumblr post. I then there are more Espiritismo things like blue water, alumbre, and camphor water. Then a skip and a jump through horseshoes and garlic, and then more marketable Mexicanisms like the chancla, and then like three protection spells, I don't... Neck-breaking speed! We turn to talk about the ancestors. More wholesale taking from Espiritismo Cruzado with the boveda and the ancestral elevation. There's a way to summon your ancestors, but not a way to send them back. Shoehorned in the tail end of this chapter is an FAQ portion. Chunky placement, boring questions, moving on. The book finally ends with a prayer for the liminal, which I find quite sweet. I enjoy it. I'd maybe actually use it if we didn't spend the last 200 pages upholding borders, racism, and colonialism this prayer prays against. There's a minimal biography, bibliography, and recommended reading section, and well, you've seen all this before. It's been read over in every single other review you've ever seen of this book. I'm leaving. I'm done now. Buy the book if you want. I am exhausted. It's a no from me. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Spirit Critique. If you enjoyed it and want some more content or want to hear my unfiltered thoughts on American Brujeria by J. Allen Cross, please check out my Patreon video. The full video is posted over there. Go enjoy it.
<clears throat> All of my links are down below. Thank you so much for your support and appreciation. Please leave your comments, your thoughts, and opinions down below. I want to hear from the diehard fans of this book. Like, I know y'all are out there. I want to know what you have to think about this. Until next time, that's all I have to offer you. It is peace I offer you, and it is in peace I leave you. Have a wonderful day. Let there be light. Hi. Hello and welcome back to Spirit Critic, the segment where I forget my intro because I didn't add it to the script. Oh, hello. Of course, another bullshit. Did I do it in the... In the most biblical sense, I am beyond repentance. Thine hook of prostitute wench thou makes on mind. But in the cultural sense, I just speak in future tense. Judas is me if offense. Do it here, come the next time. I claim to start for me. It's so cool, are you fucking kidding me? Here we go.